if we can pull this off. All right, let's get the screen up. Okay, everybody see PLCs part D? Yes, sir. All right, let's get it on. Okay, so the first little part, some sequential function charts here. We're gonna get you through the basics, uh, look at the basic instructions and how the, how the logic of it kind of works. So let's get going here. Okay, the objective here is to, wait a second. Describe PLC mixed language programs. Well, that comes later. For now, we're going to be looking at sequential function charts. Okay, so what is a sequential function chart, or SFC? It is a graphical language designed to control processes that consist of steps that are completed, completed in a specific sequence. So I have a slide at the end here that kind of tells you where sequential function charts shine. Uh, but this is a clue here. When we have processes that consist of steps that are to be completed in a specific sequence. So uh, batch processes are good examples, uh, startups, start uh, shutdowns, uh, manufacturing lines, things like that, where things have to be done in a certain number of steps. Whereas we looked at things like uh, function block, for example, uh, was really good at PID control, right? So different languages, different applications. Sequential function chart is based on symbols because it's a graphic language and we are going to be looking at the basic elements of SFC which are steps, transitions, and orientation links. And these are just the, the map or the way that we draw uh, or graphically represent the program. So these are the building blocks I guess that we're going to look at. Okay, first one is a step. It's a step in an SFC program. Uh, is a square box with a number in it that indicates what, what step it is. Uh, the first step in the program, or the initial step, will have a double, double box border, whereas any subsequent steps will just have single box borders. Uh, there is another uh, graphic that we'll talk about in a few slides that's a little bit different, but all the steps are in a box and have a number. Each step has at least two attributes attached to the step name, and they'll look something like, uh, you know, step 105 or step 102 or step whatever it happens to be step one dot x and then step one dot t um t is the time that the that, that step has been active and x is i think the boolean variable i can't i can't recall um but at any rate these are these are what steps are so it's a logical sequence in numerical and numerical steps. This is what it looks like in the ILM. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like in real life on the right hand side over here. Uh, so you'll see a square box that says step three, whatever, and then we'll have uh, some kind of function performed by it. We'll talk about that as we as we move forward. Okay, second building block here is called a transition. Here's the transition symbol. It's a horizontal uh, horizontal line here. And what transitions do uh, they are uh, a qualifier that allows you to come from one step and go to the to the next step. So transitions have to evaluate the Boolean expression, and only if that expression is true can the program continue to the next step. So if we looked at this one here, uh, transition 100 says uh, fill vessel uh, level uh, is level that is greater than six. So if that becomes true then we get to go on to the next step. If it is not true, we don't get to go on to the next step. It's pretty straightforward in that regard. Third is the third step here, or third building block is called an orientation link. So that's this line that connects uh, a step to a transition and from a transition to the next step. So these are called orientation links. This is also an orientation link. It's a link between uh, one step and another step. And one, uh, a step cannot be followed by another step, and a transition cannot be followed by a transition. And I kind of don't know why we even have to say that, but in order to progress, you have to have a step, a link, a transition, a link, a step, a link, a transition, 
and it's got to go that way. You can't have you can't have step step step, and you can't have transition transition transition. It's got to be built this way. This is the way it has to be done. So step orientation link transition orientation link step orientation link transition orientation link step and so on and, and so forth. So it will make more sense when we look at it uh, in a program. Okay, Boolean actions. Uh, we see things here, Boolean actions that occur as, as a function of a step. So we have a step, it's obviously got to perform some type of, a, of an action. We, we want it to do something. Um, and those are Boolean actions, which will assign a true or a false to a Boolean variable when a step becomes active. Uh, different syntax that you'll see out there. Um, as you'll see here, um, loop pump 101R, uh, loop pump 101S, uh, for example, these are different um, different variables. So here, Boolean variable uh, N, which we don't have here, uh, assigns a step activity signal to the variable. Yeah, wonderful. It doesn't make much sense at this point in time because there isn't one there. Uh, the S and the R are here, however, and we'll look at those. Uh, S, if you haven't guessed, uh, stands for set, R kind of stands for reset. And what it means here is we have Boolean variable S as we have here, it says sets the variable to true when the step activity signal becomes true. So if this becomes true, then we'll start the loop pump. The loop pump gets started. Uh, a timer runs for 10 seconds. After that 10 seconds expires, then we move on to the next step and then we can perform the next step. Uh, we get down over here, we have uh, motor 101R, so this is another Boolean variable, it's either on or off. This resets the variable to false when the step activity signal becomes true. So uh, if the, the stop button becomes pressed, then it'll execute this step, which will reset the motor, and after 10 seconds, the motor will turn off. Um, we'll get into that as you uh, work your way through some of these programs. Okay, pulsed actions uh, in Boolean here, page seven. Let me just flip along while we're here. Pulsed actions uh, executed only once at the activation of a step. These things with N on them, they get scanned every time there's a scan cycle. So if the scan is 10 times per second, for example, uh, or 100 milliseconds, it's going to do 10 scans uh, every time. Every time the cycle goes through, it's going to it's going to scan and look at that data. Um, with a uh, pulse, it's only going to be executed once, so it's going to look at that value once. It's not going to reevaluate every time uh, the scan cycle occurs. It's only going to reevaluate it once the program goes through uh, its complete cycle. Okay, uh, post action is written in a specific type of syntax. Uh, action, P for pulsed, colon, some kind of a statement, another kind of a statement, and then end action. So it's kind of like structured text uh, in this regard where there's a specific type of syntax that has to be um, followed. So for example here, uh, pulsed action, X, Y, on, uh, X, is true, Y is true, and action. So it just looks at it once and it goes through this syntax. We don't have enough information in the ILM for us to get really fluent in all of this kind of stuff, um, but uh, at a bare minimum, be able to identify uh, a pulsed action, and it's pretty easy because uh, it's got the P there, and the general idea of what the syntax looks like. This is a question in the back of the ILM that says, hey, Rick, can you write? Can you write a pulsed action uh, that looks like this? And, and that's what it kind of looks like. And I don't expect you to do um, much more than that. Okay, here's a motor start stop with counter. So this is on page seven here, that kind of uh, first look at how the sequential function chart works. So we have the initial, initial step with the double box here and a bunch of other steps, five steps in this case. Uh, we have one transition, two transitions, three transitions, four transitions, five transitions, and a bunch of activities. So the thing with the sequential function chart 
uh, programming is they all they always they always start off okay they always start off and the reason that they always start off is because the last instruction in a sequential function chart is usually a reset function which means that it's going to in this case reset motor 101 or turn motor 101 off so generally when you get up here to the start it's everything is going to be is everything going to be off so uh, let's just see what this program looks like here. So a couple of timers here, uh, GS2 timer at 10 seconds, uh, GS4 timer here also at 10 seconds. So let's, let's read through this and see what it says here. So this program starts a loop pump 10 seconds before starting a motor and continues to run the loop pump for 10 seconds after stopping the motor. In addition, this program will count the number of times the motor is started. And here's how it works. So the SFC program starts at step one. And as step one becomes active, the program is executed, which sense sets the counter to zero. So pulsed action counter equals zero. So it makes the counter equals zero. And it only gets executed once. The execution then goes to step two uh, immediately after performing that pulsed action in step one when uh, the transition T1 is true. So in this case, T1 will be true. Once this does its reset, this transition becomes true and we can move on to the second step. Uh, da, 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 this step here then resets the uh, loop pump and the motor. So the R tell you, tells you here that this resets the uh, new pump and the motor so nothing is running in, running here so if that becomes true then we get to go to the start uh, transition if the start gets pressed then this transition becomes true we get to go to uh, step three which tells us to set the loop pump the loop pump is going to be set which means essentially started once the loop pump starts it goes to this transition. The transition says, before you can go on, you have to be running for 10 seconds. After that 10 seconds becomes true, this transition becomes true, and we move on to step four. When we get to step four, motor 101 uh, tag here gets set to true, AKA the motor starts, the counter increases by one because we've started the motor uh, you press the start button once, so it's a pulsed action, hence we have the syntax in here that represents uh, a pulsed action. And then it'll continue to run as long as stop is not pressed. If stop gets pressed, then this transition becomes true. Step 5 will execute, which involves a motor 101R instruction, which will reset the motor. And that will become true after 10 seconds uh, of, of running. So the loop pump will stay on for 10 seconds and then the, the motor will turn off. So a little bit more challenging, at least it is a little bit more challenging for me to understand the, the way that it works, but you, you get the idea. Here's a step. This has, to, this has to happen. If this happens, then we go to here. If its requirement is true, then it moves on. If it's not true, it, it doesn't move on. Simple as that. Okay, we'll talk a little here about stored and non-stored actions. Um, so a non-stored action is executed over and over again as long as the step is active. And again, that's um, identified here, non-stored actions, by having this N in here, as you'll see. N over here for a non-stored action, P over here for a pulsed action. Again, identification is half the battle. Okay, non-stored is executed every scan cycle, so many times a second, whereas pulse is only scanned once it, per program cycle, like, like the counter. The non-stored value here is executed many, many times a second. So if we looked at this one uh, here, this pulse action, uh, as it goes through here, the motor count is only going to count one time. Every time we press the start button or every time we start the motor, 
it's only going to count it once as, as it comes past this step. Whereas a non-stored uh, instruction that we have here, if we press start, it's going to count every time the program gets scanned. Um, I believe they say in the ILM that this program is 100 milliseconds or scans uh, 10, times a, 10 times a second or something like that, which means that every scan cycle, it's going to count up to 100 because it's counting one 10, 10 times every second for 10 seconds. So it's going to count up to 100. So that's the difference between a post action and a, and a, a non-stored action. Okay, uh, another building, next building block, blocks here. So the basic ones again, steps, orientation links, transitions, then we're adding in some new things here. And this new little addition here is, is kind of like uh, an or. So I get to this point here and I have this transition and I have this transition. So one or the other of these has to become true before we can execute the stuff that is following after that. So this single line, as we see coming across here, this single line that we see going back, it's kind of a loop back here. The single line is called a single divergence. So we're diverging or we're leaving the program and then we're converging or we're coming back together in the program. So single divergence with a single line is a, this definition is kind of doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but single divergence is a multiple link from one step to more than one transition. So here's one step and it's going to this transition and this transition. Okay, so two transitions. Single conversion is a multiple link from many transitions to the same step. So this one here is coming from this transition and this transition and going to uh, another step. Single divergence and convergence are treated like an or. Okay, so if we relate this back to a ladder diagram, this would be like having, it'd be the, essentially the same thing, having an or, uh, an or branch going around a, a bit. So that's what you have to associate with single divergence and single convergence. Where does it come from? It comes from a single step to two transitions or from two transitions back to a single step. And it's like an or. The other, I think the last building block we look at, oh darn, not quite yet. Okay, the next component that we're going to look at in SFC here is called a macro step. Uh, and a macro step is, is similar to a subroutine, uh, but in the language of SFC. So macro steps are designed to make an SFC program more readable, just like subroutines were for a ladder diagram, right? Instead of having a, a great big ladder diagram that has that, let's say the input output formula map all in there that you have to look at all the time, you just put a little JSR to uh, a convert subroutine and it, it does this little thing. So this is the equivalent in SFC. So what we have here is another block. As you can see, I mentioned earlier, there's going to be a, another block that's a little bit different. So we have the initial step with two, two borders all the way around it. We have a normal step with one border all the way around it. And then we have this new one here, uh, two lines on top and two lines on bottom, which designates what we call a macro step. Um, and this macro step is essentially what we got here is this arrow. Uh, everything that's going on inside of step number two is right here. So this is step number two. You'll see it's uh, it's not part of it's not part of the SFC program, which is right here. This is not a continuation of it. This is what is contained inside of step two. So it's like a subroutine. Okay, double divergence and double convergence. So similar to the single divergence and single convergence, but they're doubles. Okay, again, looking at them, double, we're leaving here, so it's diverging. We're coming back in, so it's converging. How is this different than single? Well, this is treated like an and. Okay, so a single one is like an or, a double is like an and. So in order to carry on with uh, transition number three, this sequence and this sequence must be true. OK, 
Okay, so here, big red letters, sequential function chart programming is for applications that require tasks to be completed in a specific order, like batch processes, startups, shutdowns, and manufacturing lines. And as you read through the section there in the ILM, you'll see that most of the processes that it's giving you uh, programs for are either a batch type program or something that comes off and on, you know, once in a while kind of thing. Uh, not PID control, not complex math, uh, not, not things like that where uh, other languages are more proficient. Okay, so this is the, the, the main purpose for SFC is, is these kind of uh, sequential activities that get performed in steps one after the other. Okay, objective two introduces us to mashing all these languages together. So we've talked about ladder diagrams, function block diagrams, structured, structured text, uh, sequential function charts. We haven't talked about this fifth language here, which is called instruction list. And I can't remember if we actually do. I don't think we actually do, but it would be a great question uh, for a test. Um, what are the five languages? I'm pretty sure you'll get ladder, function block, structured text, and SFC. Um, but the fifth one is instruction list. Okay, uh, this graphic I added in here because we left off from here saying SFC is good for uh, this kind of stuff. And this little chart kind of tells you all in one what the best applications uh, are for the different types of languages. So ladder diagrams, uh, continuous multiple operations, not sequenced, you'll notice. Uh, function blocks as drive control or process loop control. That's because we have that PID block that we can drop in there that works so well. Uh, SFC, um, batch processes, startups, shutdowns, etc. Uh, structure text, complex math operations. If I was a betting man, I'd have a question related to this entire chart for every one of these languages. Um, that is a basic, basic understanding of the languages and where they're where they're applied. So this is this is a pretty important chart, I would say. Um, if you walk out of this section uh, knowing nothing other than where to use the proper language, that's probably worthwhile. Um, I, expect, I expect way more, but at a very, very minimum, you should understand that there's different languages and they have these different purposes. Okay, so how does that look when we start throwing these different languages into the same program? Uh, and that's really what we're building up, up to here. Uh, we have, you know, ladder logic, which everybody is really comfortable with. And it's kind of like the, the basic language that most people use. And then inside of this, we can integrate all the different languages if we want to here. So uh, we did it before with a jump to subroutine where we uh, did a JSR when we had a, a structured text program somewhere else that we uh, had written. Uh, we can do the same exact thing with SFC. So here I call up a, a JSR and that calls up a, a sequential function chart routine called batch. And here it is, the batch SFC chart here. So um, moving forward, we're going to be looking at how do we integrate these different languages into the program. And we know that we can do it because we, we've seen a couple of examples, uh, one previously uh, with structured text and then another one here. Um, with some SFC in it. Um, but basically all we're doing is we're, we're telling it to go, we're telling it with the JSR to go find, find that subroutine and, and execute it. And it'll go out there and it'll find it somewhere in our PLC program and it will execute it. And the next bunch of slides, uh, we'll talk about how the PLC system is organized and where, where are all of these programs that we're talking about? We have a main program, obviously, and then we have all these little subroutines or other programs, and that's what we're going to be looking at uh, in the balance of uh, the ILM, I believe. Okay, so skipping along, I think I jumped a few pages here. Where was I? Oh, maybe a couple of pages. Jump a couple of pages. 
um, page 20 here. So program organization. Lucky for us uh, and, and uh, you in particular, because you're all younger and you're all computer literate, most PLC software packages are very Windows type friendly uh, in terms of organization. So if you understand how Windows Explorer works, most PLC programs, DCF programs work in the same kind of way with the tree on the left hand side where you can expand uh, and reduce and you know have different folders hidden inside of other folders, et cetera. So uh, system folder contains different elements. So all these little things here are elements. Each folder has a purpose and will usually have some subfolders. And this basically lays out the entire structure of our system. Uh, it'll make more sense, of course, when we get into the lab when you see this in real life, but this is probably the most realistic graphic that we've looked at so far in terms of uh, the IOMs converting over to what the software actually looks like. So all of these things that you're going to, uh, you're going to find when we get into the lab. So you'll have global tags. This is where we assign the, you know, the IO to the data table. Uh, so we'll have our TT 101 and our PS 101 and our HS 101, and they'll all be assigned to inputs and output addresses and and uh, data tables where they can uh, where the program can get information. Then we have task folder. Uh, inside the task folder, there will be main tasks. There will be periodic tasks, and we've talked about periodic tasks before. Uh, there will be event tasks, which are you know a certain thing happens and the stuff that's in here will be executed. Uh, periodic tasks, they happen on a time schedule. Uh, the main task is basically the, the main program that's running all the time. Okay, uh, other folders, uh, communications folders, configuration folders. So how do we set up all our cards? What does our rack look like? All that kind of stuff. So all part of the program organization that we'll get more familiar with. Okay, the task folder right here, tasks. Start about, we'll start talking about that. Oops. Three common types of tasks, uh, continuous, periodic, and event. And they're pretty self-explanatory. Continuous tasks are executed all the time, and they have the lowest priority. Periodic tasks are, as you would guess, executed at a set time or a certain period of time. And event-type tasks are triggered by an event. And these are considered to have the highest priority. So, for example, uh, high pressure in our high gas pressure in our separator tank. If we get a high pressure, uh, we get a high pressure alarm, for example, and we want to flare. So that's triggered by a high pressure alarm. It's an event type task. Okay, what does that look like? Here we have a timing chart. And they kind of lay everything out here. So continuous task happens all the time. It's it's related to the scan cycle. So however often your scan cycle is here, it's going to continuously uh, operate. Periodic task here, every, in this case, 50 milliseconds, it's going to execute. So 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 150 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 250, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to execute every set period of time. Then we have uh, an event task, which of course relies on a specific event in order to execute. And that shows up uh, here on the timing chart. So pretty straightforward, hopefully, at, that, at this point. OK, program file organization. Back to our uh, Explorer tree here again. Global tags, we have tasks inside the tasks. We have the main task inside the main task. We've got the main program, and we could have other programs. I know it's confusing if you never do it, but this is the way it goes. Okay, each program file must have a routine that is, that is designated as the main routine. So here we have our program files, and we have a main routine. We have local tags that are used in routines within the program folder and isolated from other program folders. So what that means here is a local tag, local tag only used 
within this program. The tags that we uh, configure here cannot be used here. Okay, and we'll talk about that again a little bit later. Um, if we want to use a tag throughout, we have what are called global tags. Global tags are stored uh, up here. And uh, I may be not smart enough to talk to this, but the question usually comes up, well, why wouldn't I just put all my tags up here in the global tags and I can use them wherever I want to? And the answer to that is yes, that would in fact be true. Um, I guess the problem with that would be if you have tasks, for example, that are periodic tasks, um, you wouldn't want them in there because then they get scanned all the time. That'd be my best. That'd be my best answer. But if you have information that you want to use throughout all of your programs, uh, this subroutine, this main program, this this one, this one, this one, you would put them probably in the global tags area. But more general information for you guys. Okay, each routine is programmed in one language. A jump to subroutine can be used to call up a subroutine that is in a different language. So we're talking about mixed language programming here and the structure of it and how what it looks like. And this is kind of what it looks like here. So I'll have a uh, main program, then I'll have other, uh, other routines. So I have a main routine and I may call a subroutine. Subroutine C could be a structured text subroutine. Subroutine D could be uh, a sequential function chart uh program but um they're all initiated within the main program with a jump to subroutine call and it'll call up the, the relevant subroutine of the language that we're looking for okay tags uh local tags are used in your program and sub programs and global tags are used by all routines That kind of went quick. Yeah, I guess that's legit. Okay, uh, describe PLC integration to various field bus devices. So here we're talking about things that you've probably experienced uh, already. Uh, I give you some uh, good background on it. So if you look at any control system, probably any major control system, uh, if you worked in a facility or something like that, uh, you've probably seen this. You have an I.O. rack on there. Uh, you have all kinds of inputs and outputs, pressure transmitters, switches, uh, all kinds of stuff. Some of it is point to point, you know, twisted, twisted pair wiring, analog devices. Some of it is heart. Uh, maybe some of it's field bus, uh, different types of protocols, different technologies. Um, we have to be able to bring them all into into our into our system so uh, this objective talks about how do we integrate various field bus devices into uh, into our system okay so talking about field bus devices again we, we touched on this earlier field bus is a digital network for communication with low level industrial control and instrumentation devices so this is our control network common field buses uh, that we'll talk about, and this is kind of uh, breadcrumbs, I guess, uh, leading us into some of the stuff we're going to be talking about in protocols and why protocols is so painful is because we look at all of the different types of field buses uh, individually, and then we kind of break them apart into how are they similar and how are they different. Uh, and when we do it, we kind of go at, at increasing technology. So we'll start out with the, the simpler ones, uh, the slower ones, the less technological ones, and then we'll talk about the next one, which is a little better, improves on some of the you know deficiencies of the earlier version. And then we'll move on to the next one, which is kind of the state of the state of the technology as we are today. So common field buses uh, that we're looking at anyway, uh, device net, art, and foundation field bus. Okay, device net. And I don't know, this might be a good time for you to, I don't know, make a little matrix or something like that, you know, put device net on there and give yourself three or four columns. Uh, heart, give yourself three or four columns. Uh, field bus, give yourself three or four columns. Then you can kind of compare 
all the data in a chart. I think I have one uh, somewhere I might give to you, but uh, if you need to, you know, if you're the kind of learner that likes to look at things and repeat it, see everything at once, you, it might serve you well to have a little matrix set up because we're going to look at device neck. We're going to talk about certain characteristics of it. Then we're going to look at the next uh, field bus type and we're going to look at the same things and how they kind of compare. Uh, and that's most of this section. Okay, so device net is a open communication standard and we talked about open versus proprietary last lecture uh, in which we can have up to 63 devices uh, connected to a device net scanner. So a device net scanner is that device that brings all the data off, off the field bus and sorts it out for us. Uh, and for device net, we can have up to 63 devices on our bus. Uh, you remember from last year and earlier conversations that heart was 15, right? So we'll see that again probably as, as we move forward here. But if we're going to integrate it into our system, our PLC system here, our rack, you'll see that we have a unique card here. Uh, it's just got an S on it, but this represents the device net scanner card. And what the scanner card does is it goes out here and it pulls all of this information that says, give me your information, 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 give me your information. The devices all send that information to here. It sorts it all out, sends it to the CPU so the program can be executed. Then it updates the data tables and then this will send data back out to all the devices that need it. So device net, open 63 devices. Okay, how does it work? I guess I kind of explained it all here, but uh, we have our devices. The devices send their information to the scanner model module, input memory. The scanner module sends that data to the controller. The controller does its magical computations, runs it through the program, then sends its data uh, out to the output memory table of the scanner, mod scanner module, which gets updated, and then it sends that new updated uh, information back up to the device and the cycle continues every so many milliseconds. Okay, uh, how do we configure one of these scanners? Some basic steps. Uh, when you're configuring, uh, configuring, that's a new word I just invented. When you're configuring things, always upload your current configuration first. Always. Anytime you get to the PLC, you're going to do any kind of PLC work whatsoever, upload what you've got now. Save it, back it up, cover your ass. You've got it to fall back on in case you have a really bad day and you just got to say, I'm going back to where I started. So first thing you do, upload current configuration. Then you got to define the communication properties required and that varies depending on the type of field bus network that we're dealing with. Uh, then you'll build the scan list, which is essentially the list of devices that are communicating with the scanner. So all your addresses uh, for device net 0 to 63, what are they? TT101, TT102, TT103, PT101, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You build, you build that scan list. <clears throat> then you download the update to the scanner. So that's the process of configuring the uh, scanner in very general terms. Okay, device net, uh, device failure, device net by nature fails to the last state. It does this by using a separate status bit that indicates uh, the state of the device. Because this is a, this is a status bit, you'll see input 10.5, output 4.0, and here we have S for status. 10.5, which is telling us what is the status of the level switch. And that's a characteristic of device net. So it fails to last state. Most systems fail to last state, but they make particular note of, of this in device net. Okay, heart. How does this look compared to device net? Heart also is an open pro protocol, uses a digital signal superimposed on the 4 to 20 amp milliamp signal here. 4 to 20 milliamps is used for fast measurements and digital signals allow for multi, multiple process variables, status, diagnostics, remote configuration, all the wonderful things that you get with digital communication, which is what we're focusing on 
in fourth year. Okay, so not a lot there. Uh, heart point to point can uh, an analog point to point. It connects to its uh, unique connection point or its particular channel. Uh, point to point is the most common PLC connection method. Probably still to date, um, but again, fourth year we're kind of trying to lead you down the uh, multi-drop bus or the field bus route. Um, but we talked a little bit about heart and its basicness, and we've done this several times now. So, heart in its most simplest form is point to point. Okay, there are different different levels of heart integration because it's a hybrid. We can have basic integration, basic integration with Heart I.O., which introduces some of the digital capabilities of Heart. Then we have advanced integration with Heart I.O., again, adding a little bit more to it. And then finally, full integration on Heart, where we get full digital, all the bells, whistles, options that are associated with digital communication. And the ILM goes into a little bit more detail on uh, defining what basic, basic with heart, advanced with heart, and full integration are. <clears throat> oh, and look, looks like I do too. Okay, so basic integration. PLC's IO modules do not have a heart modem. So if we looked at our rack here, we see that we just have regular analog inputs, regular analog outputs here. If we were talking about something uh, more complicated, it would be a heart module, but we don't have that here. The only way to communicate to the transmitter in this case, basic integration is through the heart communicator. Basic integration with heart. Let me just check make sure my pages are falling sort of. Yep, they are good. Okay, the PLC has heart IO modules, excuse me, that can access additional data such as faults and device channel faults and some of the diagnostic features that are available with heart. Primary variable is still accessed over that 4 to 20 milliamp signal. And to configure the heart device, a heart communicator is still necessary. So only thing we really gained here is that we are now using a heart IO module in the rack. And we get a couple of, you know, simple diagnostic features added to it. Next up, advanced integration with Heart I.O. This now utilizes the digital primary and secondary variables that are available over Heart, along with the statuses that we picked up in the previous step. Uh, digital values are now used for higher accuracy, but we can still use the 4020 signal if we want it to be faster. Remember, we said that the analog signal is faster because it doesn't have to get converted from analog to digital, to digital to analog, all that kind of good stuff. Okay, heart communicator still required for configurating, configurating here. I love that word, configurating. Okay, finally, full integration. Uh, it would be up, I would be happier if they showed the heart card there, but they don't. Full integration allows for the configuration of heart devices and the collection of diagnostic information from an asset management system. Uh, if you're into the um, Rosemount type stuff, their asset management system is actually called AMS, which oddly enough stands for asset management system. Wonderful. But this asset management system is tied into the uh, PLC hardware through uh, a network card here. And we can now do all the wonderful things that we do with the heart communicator from the computer. Okay, multi-drop heart. This is what we're kind of building up to. Uh, not as common as point to point to this day, and it probably never, it probably never will be. Um, because if we're going to get into multi-dropping, um, there's technologies out there that are much better at it than heart. Um, and that's kind of why we're talking about the different ones. Okay, multi-drop heart, not as common as point to point, slower update rates, um, and they require a capable uh, card in order to be able to do multi-drop. And you can see here, as we had a device net scanner, we now have a heart protocol type scanner that uh, handles the data coming in and out from our multi-drop network here. 
Third protocol, Foundation Field Bus, also open. So all three of them have been open so far. Foundation Field Bus, uh, evolutionary-wise, is more advanced and is based on two different types of networks. They are called the High Speed Ethernet Network, which we'll abbreviate as HSE in the future, and the H1 Network. And you'll see in the diagram here that the high, oops, the HSE network is from the rack to our control station. So it's an ethernet network that is simply getting data out of the rack to our workstations. And the H1 network is our field network, okay? In order to connect the two networks together, the HSE network and the H1 network, we have something called a FFLD or Foundation Field Bus Linking Device. And it's just a piece of hardware that allows communication between the Ethernet type protocol that's here and the H1 protocol that's out here. Okay, what is unique about Foundation Field Bus is the capability to distribute control across the network. And what that means is a foundation field bus device can have PID control built into the device. So it doesn't have to be part of your program, which is unique. I don't know the applications where you would do that, um, but that is what makes foundation really unique compared to heart and device net. And there's the fact that it can do PID stuff right inside the devices themselves. Okay. Uh, the H1 network connects uh, devices and the FFLD together. That's not exactly true. The FFLD connects the H1 network together to the HSE network. Okay, control uh, done in the PLC here, for example. Uh, in a regular system, I would have my tr transmitter coming to an analog input card addressed to, to that, and then I'd go to, and then I'd go, just give me a second here, Michael, then I'd go to my function block program, and it would execute PID uh, algorithms based on the raw data from FT101, and then provide an output to FE101. Just to tie this all in here, uh, I'll get to you, Michael, here. Foundation can take the information from the field device, in this case, this uh, uh, Coriolis meter, it looks like. Take that device, provide a, a, an output, and send it directly to the final control element, independent of the control system. Go ahead, Michael. So what's the H1 network? The H1 network is the, the field bus network that all the end devices connect to, okay? So everything here in red is outside in the field, okay? This is outside in the field. Then it'll come into a marshalling cabinet. The marshalling cabinet will have this linking device in it. And then coming out of the linking device will be an Ethernet cable that connects into, uh, into the rack. And then from the rack, we can access the data from a workstation. So this is an Ethernet network. And this is a, uh, a, a wired network, like a two-wire, or a, it's actually a four-wire network for Foundation Field Bus. But this is a four-wire network out in the field. So this is the field bus. So it connects all of our end devices, transmitters, valves, it connects them all together, brings that information into the, into the marshalling cabinet. And then the HSE network also comes into that marshalling cabinet and that's where it pulls out its information. So it's two separate networks that are working together. That so for the, for the red line below is H1 network, but the green one is the Ethernet. So the That's field right. wires tie into the marshalling panel did not tie into the chassis directly. That's right. That's right. 
Yeah. They do not tie into the chassis directly. So the you feel the marshalling box connect to the chassis through Ethernet cable? Yes. 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 This is Ethernet cable here to here. And this is regular, regular wire. Okay, and the and the idea um, the idea is, is that this is in the field, so you got to have shielding and and twisted pair and all that kind of wonderful stuff, you know, so you don't get EMF disruptions. And then the HSE network is is a high speed data transfer between uh, between the controller and and the workstation. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So control is. Uh, when we're talking about foundation field bus and this unique thing of being able to uh, have PID out in the field, this is this is what it looks like. The control is done in the H1 network by the end devices themselves. So don't have to worry about the details about how this works, um, but know that this is one of the big benefits of foundation field bus. I'm not a field bus guy. Uh, I've never worked with foundation field bus um, very much in my life. Um, but I'm sure that there are probably facilities out there right now uh, that are entirely uh, field bus. But I, again, I've been out for quite a while. Okay, so that was uh, three different types of uh, protocols. I want to call them protocols, um, but there are different types of systems. Um, but the idea there is that we can we can integrate all of them individually or all at once into the same into the same control system. All we need is the, uh, the specific card, uh, a field bus card, a device net card, a heart card. Um, we have those cards. We can take full advantage of all the digital capabilities of field bus communication. Okie dokie, where we are here. Oops, excuse me. Redundancy, as it applies to PLCs. So lots of us have probably dealt with redundancy before if we have uh, you know important processes that make us money all day long uh, you, you want to have you want to have a backup right and that's basically what redundancy is and it can be as simple as having uh, two pressure transmitters on the line in case one transmitter goes down then you got another one to go or it can be as complicated as having two complete PLC systems with all the IO and all the cards and all the back planes and all the processors and all the servers and everything. So this next section talks about uh, redundancy and PLCs. Okay, redundancy is a parallel or secondary system that takes over when the primary system fails. So that control can continue uninterrupted. So pretty important if you're in the business of making money and you don't want downtime, you are generally gonna have some type of redundancy. The amount of redundancy required is based on the availability needs of the system. How important is it to you? Uh, we categorize the availability in three categories. They are basic availability, high availability, and fault tolerance. And you'll need to know these three and what they mean. And we'll have a slide that will talk about each of them. Okay, basic availability is basic. Okay, let's, let's get that out of the way first. We're gonna start out with basic, then we're gonna have the next one, which is not so basic, and then we're gonna have the last one, which is the gold standard. Okay, so basic availability satisfies the system's functional requirements only as long as no faults occur. If we were to have a fault in it, the controller, it results in all the modules going to their fail-safe state. So, not what we would call very reliable or very secure or very safe and definitely not redundant. Okay, very basic. As long as nothing is bad, everything works. As soon as something is bad, nothing works. High availability. Notice here we got a little bit more hardware going on here, right? Like here we got field devices, Input cards, output cards, one CPU, one network. Here, in high availability, a 
fault in the primary controller, the power supply, or the network modules will cause the secondary controller to take over without shutdown. Okay, we have redundant. Redundant, two of those, two of those, two of these, two of those, two of everything. So if this controller failed, this one would take over. No hiccups, no problem. The process, when one fails and the call is made to the second one to come online, is called cross-loading and switch over, which means cross-loading means it's taking the current data <coughs> just before fail, just before failure, cross-loading it, meaning sending it to the second controller at the same time, so they got the same data. And when this one fails, it switches over. So that the process is called cross-loading and switch over. Uh, this is in yellow, I'm assuming, uh, self-test. Okay, that's pretty good, right? And one of them fails, we got a backup, that's awesome. Um, last but not least here, we have fault tolerant. Fault tolerant PLC system prevents a critical process from going down for any reason. And a fault tolerant uh, pro uh, mechanism can be repaired without interrupting the process. Okay, so that means that uh, if you had, if one failed, this guy failed, this guy would automatically take over. You could go in there, uh, replace the card, whatever you had to do, and life would be good. So three different levels, basic availability, high availability, and fault tolerant. And there's a little bit more to fault tolerant than I said. Um, but the long, uh, the short story here is that it allows us to repair the fault without interrupting the process. Uh, let's see how can I can relate this one here. Let me see. Do, do. I'm not going to say anything because it'll probably just confuse me and myself. Okay. Uh, next learning objective. That was quick. Yeah, a lot more reading. Alrighty, uh, pay attention here because we don't do this in practice. Uh, when you come to school and we go into the lab, we got playing with the PLC programs and we change things as we wish all willy nilly um, because there is no consequences, right? Uh, and maybe that's a bad habit that maybe I'm enabling, um, but I want you to make sure that you pay attention to this stuff in this next next objective, especially if you think you're ever find yourself programming in the field, um, because we don't necessarily follow these practices in our labs, um, because there's no consequences in our labs. Um, but in the real world, there are serious consequences. So um, understanding the safety considerations uh, that are involved when we make changes are important. So we'll look at um, making changes online, forcing, disabling, and bypassing I.O. And these are all functions that you can do within the uh, PLC software program. Uh, and they're, they're, good. they're good tools. Some of them are good tools for diagnostics, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> but you have to be careful when you're doing it, because if you're doing it in a live plant, you're forcing things or disabling things, you can set yourself up for some pretty big disasters. All right. Talking about online edit. So we online edit means that we're inside the PLC program, the plant is running, the program is running, and we're gonna go in there and we're gonna change things when the plant is running. Very dangerous, so be careful. Okay, so online edits allow us to change the programming while the PLC is running, and we should always do certain things before we edit online. Sit down for a second, think about what you're about to do, and assess how the poop can hit the fan. Understand what you are doing and what the effects can be. Secondly, you're gonna to wanna to notify operation because if the poo does hit the fan, operations are gonna be the ones that cover your ass and, and save you. We also, as I said earlier, before we start any type of programming activity, always upload and save the current configuration so that if things go bad, you can reset it to where you were when your shift started. Okay, so to do an online edit, we will first start a pending edit, 
then we make our edits, accept our edits, test the edits, assemble the edits, and save the edits. Wow, doesn't mean anything to you at all, um, but this is true. This is the way it works. Um, without sitting in front of the machines and, and doing it, it doesn't make a whole bunch of sense. Um, but when we do sit in front of the lab, uh, in front of the PLCs in the lab, this is exactly what happens. Uh, you're gonna wanna start a pending edit, it means that you're gonna click on a rung, you're gonna alter that rung somehow, move a bit, rename a bit, whatever it is. Then there will be a software function, part of the PLC software that will say, accept the edits, meaning that you're done playing with that rung. Then there will be a button at the top. Um, there's a little button at the top of the PLC program that'll say test the edits, it'll test it. It'll tell you if you got any issues, you can go back in there and fix them. If you got no issues, you, you do what's called assembling the edits, which means that it's actually putting it together and it's gonna reinsert it into the running program. And then you save them. So this is the process and it'll make more sense when we do it. Okay, so uh, when we when we decide that we're gonna do, we're gonna say start a pending edit. So I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna click on, I'm gonna click on a rung, I'm in the program, I'll click on a rung. Oh, look at that, okay, that's kind of cool. Okay, so I'm sitting here uh, and it says here, uh, red and rung two should be green. Okay, so I've got a problem. I gotta fix it. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna click on rung two, click, and then this is gonna happen. Okay, it's gonna give me duplicate copies of the rung that I just that I just made. And it's gonna say, here's here's what I got. This is the original rung. I had this bit R and I had it energizing a green light. Well, we didn't want that. We wanted this to be uh, we, we wanted this red light to be green. Oh, sorry. So anyway, long story short, it's going to have the, the current state, this, this rung, the current state, and this would be our, uh, what the term is here, our edit. This would be our edit. So we, we have our edit there. Then we're going to, uh, we're going to see our edit is pending, which is indicated by the I here. And then we're going to say test our edits. So we're going to go up there and we'll click test our edits. And if everything is happy, this will disappear and our old run will be replaced with the new run. That's painful. Okay, the I, go ahead, Michael. So once you save it, will this just affect the next scan time? Or what when you save it, this is at the middle of the scan time at you let the one, for example, or- as soon as, as soon as you accept your edit, it will be it will be scanned the next time it comes around. So it continues on the old program in the background until you until essentially you press accept at the end, and then it'll take the new rung in and scan it the next time around. Okay, thanks. Okay, so here we make our pending edit. We do our little bit of edit here, and then we'll do accept or test our edit, and you'll see it depends on the software. Uh, the letters on the side will change, indicating that you're in the, the next phase of the editing uh, process. Um, here, uh, here it's an I and a D. It's a little bit different in the in the program that we have down in the lab, um, but it's very similar. Okay, uh, we 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 do the accept uh, accepted test, and the test mode the PLC switches it and executes the accepted edit. Everything is happily happy and good we then assemble the edit save it and it makes it permanent it backs it up uh, on the plc and, and in the pc and it is now part of our normal program and this is a little bit ugly of a, of a description it's a lot more fluid in in real life so when we get to the lab um, you do this constantly every time you change a program you're doing this process um, and it'll make a lot more sense when you're sitting in front of the machine Forcing, okay, forcing is used for testing logic, checking wiring to an output or temporarily running a process when an input fails. You'll have a force indicator, again, depending on your software, it's a different type of indicator, but there'll be a little indicator in your, in your programming software that tells you if you've got something 
that is forced. Uh, it's important to know that because if you open up a program and you see something that's forced, should trigger you to go, okay, that can't be good because forcing is usually only done when something in the field has failed or you're testing something. Uh, you normally wouldn't have any inputs or output uh, forced in a, in a normal running situation, okay? Uh, so the force indicator can be uh, off, can be on in solid or on in flashing. And again, changes uh, depending on the software manufacturer. So if the force indicator is off, then obviously there's no, there's no forces in your program. If it's on in solid, uh, that means that there is some tags in your program that contain a force and that force is actually enabled. Uh, and then if you have the force indicator flashing, it means that some tags do contain a force, but the force is disabled. Most importantly to remember here, forcing can cause unexpected process changes that can cause injury and damage equipment. You must know how forcing affects a process before you install, disable, or remove a force. Always obtain permission and follow applicable safety procedures before forcing. Generally, if you're a rookie, don't do it. Okay, disabling and bypassing, uh, equally dangerous. Uh, similar to forcing, the I.O. point value is changed in the field rather than in the PLC programming. So forcing, forcing is done inside the PLC. Right, we're, we're literally going in there and we're saying this bit that's not green, I want it to be green, so let's force it green. That's what we're doing. We're doing it in the PLC program. Disabling and bypassing, this is done in the field. Okay, so this is like, uh, oh, that level switch isn't working. So I have two choices. I can either force it in the PLC program or you can go out in the field and you can twist the two wires together. Right? That's, it's, it's a big difference, okay? Just as dangerous, do not disable or bypass IOs temporarily to keep your process operating unless company policy allows it and all safety issues have been addressed and the appropriate personnel are informed. As a general rule, you do not hotwire field devices uh, at your own risk. Objective six, describe change management as it applies to PLC program changes. So change management is basically the process of documenting uh, any activities that have to relate to the PLC program itself. So if you come in there on Monday morning and the operator says, oh, we've got an issue. Uh, we tried starting this motor, you know, 5,000 times and now we're locked out. Uh, can you can you change it so that we can start try to start the motor 10,000 times? Um, you want to document it, right? Anytime you get into the program, you alter the program, you change the program in any way, shape, or form, you've got to document it. And that is, in a nutshell, what change management is. Okay, uh, change management uh, involves using a change management system, uh, which is used to safeguard our programming. If you don't use a change management system, uh, company policies and procedures must be in place. For example, uh, you can get a change management system that actually records your initial state, any changes, and, and then your final state, much like you can have uh, a compare function in, a, in Microsoft Word, for example. You've got version one of your uh, paper and you've got version two of your paper, uh, and you can compare them side by side. And you can see what's what was originally and what what has changed change management systems allow you to do that software wise now if you don't have that then you have to have some other way to do it when i worked for the city uh, at the wastewater treatment plant we had a binder uh, next to the console that we used for programming and we would come in and we'd say okay uh, january 26 tyler sat down and in main routine uh, rung 42 i changed bit i for dot zero uh, from an XIO to an XIC and uh, fill it in. It could be that simple, a book, it could be a spreadsheet, or it could be an actual piece of uh, software that does it for you. What is the change? Uh, 
Um, change management systems are designed to protect against. Sorry about the barking in the background. I can't learn under these conditions. Is that you, puppy? Yeah. Oh, I like dogs. No worries. <laughs> Two of them. Okay. So, change management systems are designed to protect against human error. Basically, it means that if you're writing down or you're recording the things that you've done, it gives you an opportunity to, to recognize uh, potential mistakes that you made. Uh, protect also against equipment failure or controller failure, power interruptions or surges such as uh, defective batteries, uh, protect against disasters, protect against sabotage, uh, unauthorized access, uh, things of that nature. So all kinds of important things tied to the change management system. Okay, some of the things that you can find inside of a change management package include uh, backup archives, which contains data program backups. Uh, again, every time you sit down to do any type of work on the PLC system, you're going to back it up. Um, most places back up automatically at midnight anyway, um, but also good to do a backup before you do any work. Okay, so backup archives, uh, one of the big features of change management. Uh, change auditing, uh, like I said earlier, uploads the PLC program and compares it to a master copy to identify any changes. So again, it's, it's easier to do in software than it is to actually open up the program and put them side by side and visually do it yourself. Uh, secure access provided by change management systems uh, in terms of uh, user access privileges and authorizations, um, restricting users to make all changes through the CMS. So that keeps everybody uh, out of the program, uh, only allows changes from one particular place. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, geez, are we getting that close? All right, a lot of stuff that we covered there today, uh, a lot of reading. I know that a lot of the stuff I spoke about was fairly general. Uh, the purpose for that is to try to keep your mindset in the fairly general uh, stage. So, summary, there are five programming languages outlined by IC, IEC 611.31. Uh, they have different applications different uh, the program organization in the PLC allows for these mixed programs to function together. Most PLCs have the ability to integrate one or all of the different protocols, device net, hard or field bus. We must be careful when we're doing online edits, forcing or bypassing, and change management systems are fantastic because they cover our butts and protect against costly replacement of PLC programs. Could you imagine if you went in there and you accidentally deleted the program? Very bad. All right, so I think that's it. Oops, yeah, that is it. <laughs>